It's Women's Week in the Cathedral with the theme, Beyond 2020, focusing on what lies ahead. And with me today, I have the most lovely person in the form of Reverend Wilmer Gill, also known as Reverend Mother. And we're going to sit down and have a lovely chat with her. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And as promised, we have with us today, Reverend Wilma Gill. Reverend Gill, welcome to our program. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you today. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> it must be a little challenging now because you're so accustomed to just, um, ministering to others, but here you are, you are right now, what we call being on the proverbial hot seat. <laughs> it's a new experience. <laughs> <laughs> But I know it's one that you're going to shine brightly on, so I'm very happy about that. Thank you. You're welcome. So what we'll be trying to do uh, during Women's Week is to celebrate some of our female members in the congregation. And of course, we had to include you. But what I want to do right now is I want you to take us back and, and tell us all about your childhood and, and how was it growing up? Well, I was born in Queen Mary Road, Bank Hall, St. Michael. And um, I went to a private school called Miss Durant's Private School when I was about six years old. And then I went to Heinz Berry Primary School. And from there I went to St. Michael's Girls for a couple years. And because my parents lived in Trinidad, I was taken to Trinidad when I was 12 years old. Previous to that, I grew up with my aunt and her family. I am a one child, and my aunt had one child. <laughs> so we grew up together, we're cousins, but we grew up like sisters. But then I transitioned to Trinidad, and I went to Bishop Anstey High School there for a couple of years before graduating. And after that, I got into the insurance. Uh, I worked at an insurance um, company okay. called well, the Phoenix we, Insurance. Before we even go that, that far, so yeah, I want to go all the way back to growing up with your cousin and with your parents being overseas. And how was that for you, knowing that both mom and dad were overseas? How was it for you? Um, I adjusted, but my aunt and her husband became my parents. Also, I had a godmother who was a, a, like a caregiver. So I, I didn't, I wouldn't say, I, I didn't really like sort of miss them or thought that there was a vacuum or a void because that family, growing up with that family, created that secure sense of security. And so I looked to them as really my parents. Mm -hmm. And um, mom and dad, used, they used to take turns so, in coming to Barbados for holidays on different, um, different years. They would do it alternately. So are you Trinidadian by birth then? Or no, I'm Barbadian Barbados? by birth. Mm -hmm. I was born in Barbados. Mm -hmm. But nice. then I went to Trinidad when I was 12 years. I could remember that very well. And <laughs> I didn't really want to go, to be honest. <laughs> I can imagine. How was it for you over there? I mean, the, the, it's a completely different cultural experience, I could, I could imagine. Yeah, but I, I adjusted. I, I had no choice but to adjust. <laughs> and um, I quickly got into it, the schooling and, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I quickly adjusted. I didn't really have a problem adjusting. Well, how as far as I could mm -hmm. remember. As far as you can remember, that's fine. How was school life for you over there? Um, it was interesting and um, not much different from here. Yeah. You know? Did anything I, stand out for you over there in terms of teachers or classmates? Um, not particularly. I, one thing I could remember that they used to tease me because of my accent. <laughs> I could imagine. So. Um, somehow I quickly 
got into a tr the Trinidadian accent. But you adapt. I would, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I remember that part. But um, I had a few friends, you know, not many, because um, actually living um, with mom and dad at that time, it was just home and school, school and home or church. Right? So um, I didn't really have any um, like after school activities as such or anything like that. So were your parents, um, for lack of a better expression, strong Christians at that time or were they, were they implementing good solid Christian um, attributes? Yes, I point? would say um, my dad was a Methodist minister lay preacher, I just said. He was a carpenter by trade, but he was a Methodist lay preacher. My mom was an Anglican. Um, not to say at that time born again, okay. or even a baptized member of any church, but Sunday school and church were a must. We went to, I went to Sunday school and went to church. Um, of course, because he was a Methodist, sometimes I went with him, but <laughs> then sometimes I went to the Anglican church. <laughs> and um, I was confirmed as an Anglican. <laughs> and although mommy was an Anglican, yet she would go to the different churches. She would go to the Salvation Army, she would go to wherever they was having something and invited, she would go. And of course, I had to go along with her. <laughs> so how were those experiences for you? Because, you know, first of all, you're, you're having a bit of a slight contrast between a Methodist upbringing and an Anglican upbringing. And then mom is taking you to these other um, denominations, per se. How, how were those experiences for you? Especially Salvation Army, <laughs> with, the, with all those instruments. Well, yeah, but um, it would just be like for a visit. You know, not yes. just not not just not going regularly, but just for a visit because of a special service or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, apart from that, we had a neighbor that was Pentecostal, and uh, I would go to the Anglican church on a morning, and then come home and go with her to the Pentecostal church for Sunday school. <laughs> and I, I tend to gravitate towards the Pentecostal faith. Yes. And then she started taking me with her. But mommy never objected. The objection came when I wanted to get baptized. <laughs> well, what was their um, take on being baptized? Why were they, I'm, I'm thinking they were against it. What, what was their okay, happen? first of all, let me say that um, April the 1st, um, 1958 is when I accepted Christ as my Savior um, in a Billy Graham crusade in the Savannah in Trinidad. And um, I, of course, I went because mommy went. Because I could not go on my own, but we went to this crusade, <laughs> and somehow I felt that I needed to ask Christ to come into my heart, and so I received Him as my Savior at that time. I was 14 years old, yes, and um, they did follow up from the church that my neighbor went to. Mm -hmm. um, the minister, the assistant pastor, did a follow-up visit at the house. Which is, would you say that's really important? Yes. Having those follow-up visits. Right. Because mm -hmm. they were following up the converts. Yes. And I remember sitting in the living room with mommy there and she was telling them, she's okay, she's good, she was confirmed. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> need anything more. <laughs> so she won't let me have a say. Yeah, I understand. You're okay? And, um, but I know that I wanted something more than that. So the years went on, and I don't remember at what age it was that I finally decided that I was going to get baptized, whatever. <laughs> and it was a night. Um, we did baptism in the fonts in those times in the church. Okay. 
at Woodbrook Pentecostal Church. Describe these fonts for us. What the exactly font, is a font? In the it was a big, like a big, um, my, I won't like say a pool? swimming pool, mm -hmm. but it was something in the church itself, mm -hmm. like a big bathtub. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And we were, but it was built into the church. Where would it usually be situated? At the back of the church. At the back at the, of the not church? Not the back, sorry, the mm -hmm. front of mm -hmm. the church, like right behind the, like if it was this church, it would be like right behind there. And it had steps that you go down in this big tank yes. or what. Um, I think some years ago we had something like that in the oh, um, next door here to the church mm -hmm. where people were baptized. Fantastic. And so um, I finally got my way to get yes. baptized. <laughs> And I remember the night very well, and, and Mommy, she went with me, oh. even though she was not too happy about it. Mm -hmm. But um, I lived to see that she got baptized also, Christ, years, years oh. after that. I went to Bible school in 1967, in West Indy School of Theology. Yes. And I completed my three years because I felt the call of God in my life, not to be a pastor, mm -hmm. but I felt the call of God in my life to be in ministry right. and to go to Bible school. And um, on completion of my Bible school training, I was secretary to the, we call them the district superintendents at that time, the superintendent, general superintendent at that time, Reverend Patrick Ryan. Um, but now we call them general bishops, but that was, he was called the general superintendent. And I became his secretary at the time. Um, he didn't the call to go to Bible school again was not the easiest thing in the world because again mommy couldn't see why I had to give up my job in the insurance company to go to Bible school and at that time it wasn't many openings for women in in the ministry as such to say that like, you can could have a church and could pastor or whatever but I just felt that I needed to respond to the call of God in my life. And I felt that if I didn't do it, that something would have happened. <laughs> and um, so I went. I went um, and I did the three years. And then, of course, as I said, I didn't feel that I was called to pastorship, mm. pastoralship. Yes. But there was a vacancy um, for being his secretary, the, the um, bishop secretary, and I, I did that for a number of years. So that became your profession? Yes. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, the registrar at the Bible school, she was a missionary from Canada, and she, her time came where she had to go back to Canada and I was asked to be the registrar at the Bible school. And I worked in that capacity for a number of years. I don't remember exactly how many That's years right, right now. <laughs> but then in 1978, um, somehow I felt the, the desire, the need to come back to Barbados. And at the same time, my mom was thinking of relocating also. And um, I remember we were having a deeper life session at the Bible school, and Pastor Holmes was the guest speaker. And at one evening when he came in, he said to me, um, Wilma, you don't think it's time to come back home? <laughs> and so I said to him, well, I've been thinking about it. 
and maybe you're confirming what, uh, what is on my heart and my mind. I worked in the office, and at that time, when you were involved in the office, you had to know everything about the church. So I had to read every radio um, sermon you had to go through. There, there was a book, a file, with all the radio sermons, and I had to go through all of them, read all of them, and also we had something called mountain movers. So we had to know all about the mountain movers. We had to know everything concerning the church and the ministry. So I worked in the office, you know, on the office staff. And then after a few years, eventually I was his, his secretary. Because um, at the time when I came, um, Elder Edge, Phyllis Edge, she was his secretary. But then eventually, um, she was into another phase of her ministry, mm -hmm. and then I took her place. Fantastic. So how was it for you to stand in front of so many people and, 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 and minister? Because they do know you're trained at WIS to do so, but here's the reality now. Now you're practicing. <laughs> <laughs> how was it for you to stand in front of so many people and, and, and minister? The one? Uh, up to now, it's not easy. I still get very nervous wow. <laughs> when I have to stand and minister. You can't tell but, you. Um, <laughs> but the, the Holy Spirit helps you. And really, really, it's depending on the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> and uh, once you start, then you, you, you feel that confidence and that assurance. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but it's not, it's not the easiest thing <laughs> in the imagine. world. Do you have any advice for someone who would be, you know, they're longing to become a pastor, a preacher. They, they don't necessarily have that encouragement in their home, in their home to become a preacher, but they want to be a preacher. Do you have any advice for that individual who would need that gentle nudge? Um, I would say if you have a great desire to if the, if the Lord has laid on your heart and has put his hand on your life to be uh, a preacher, a minister, pastor, whatever, and you don't have that encouragement in your home, even as I didn't have, but I knew what God wanted me to do. And so I persevered in doing it. So if you, if you know that that is your calling, um, apart from praying and asking God to make the way, you have got to make up in your mind that this is what you're going to do regardless of. Yeah, and it is going to be a sacrifice, but I believe God sees our hearts and he knows exactly where he wants us, what he wants us to do, and it's a matter of submitting to him, and he will make the way. He will make the way. You know, there's some preachers out there who, um, they tend to put it out there just for the glory, to be seen, to have the biggest congregation, to be on television, to be famous. You know, um, there are a lot of them out there nowadays who are trying to do that. Um, not necessarily preaches sound doctrine. What is your opinion on that? Um, Jesus said that when he sent the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will glorify him. And if we are doing anything that's not glorifying him, then what we're doing is glorifying ourselves. And it is a matter of not doing what God wants you to do or calls you to do. Because when we minister, it's not to attract, bring attraction to us, it's to glorify Jesus. And if we are just trying to bring attention to ourselves, then that's not pleasing to God at all. And he's not getting the glory. And even though it may seem that outwardly 
we may be getting results, but it's not anything that's going to last because it's not unto him. And his word definitely teaches us that whatever we do, we do it as unto him. And it's to bring glory to him. Whatever we do, it's not to bring glory to ourselves. Um, actually, we are to decrease and let Christ be increased in us. And so it's not for the glory of man, but for his glory and for his honor. And if we're not doing it for him, then it's not going to last. It's what not going to Christ last. last. Only what you do for Christ will last. That's right. Now, I, I mentioned earlier the interview, we call you Reverend Mother. It's such a great affection because it is suitable. It suits you to a team. Um, there are some people who will come into the church. Um, they, they are now, you know, they're babes. They're now coming into the assembly. Um, I find you to be quite approachable. I really do. I genuinely do. How do you find yourself working with someone who um, braves themselves, gets all brave to come to you, to talk to you, to learn about you know, the Christian faith. And, and they, they don't have much, they don't know much. How do you find yourself communicating with someone like that? Well, you have to start from the basics, <laughs> which is <laughs> pointing them to Jesus and helping them to see that, you know, that they can make it and that they can do it with God's help. And, you know, that all of us have been there. We, we weren't, we didn't grow up and be mature all at once. We had to start from somewhere. And so it's to help them to see that in yourself, you can't do it, but you have to rely on the Lord every day to help you and to bring, get you to that place of maturity in Christ. And that you will make mistakes because I am not perfect. I have made mistakes and I'm still making mistakes. <laughs> We're not perfect, but with the help of the Holy Spirit and with yieldedness to Him and a desire to be what He wants you to be, you will make it. And it's one step at a time, one step at a time. And I always say that God's grace is sufficient for every step that you make, every test, every trial, every temptation, the grace of God is sufficient. And it's one day at a time, one step at a time. Thank you so much for having this lovely chat with me today. Reverend McGill, we honor you. We thank God for you. And we know that God has greater things in store for your ministry. Thank you for all the sacrifices that you have made over the years for us, um, for some persons who might not even necessarily attend this um, congregation. You have blessed so many people. And so on behalf of all of them, we thank you. I thank you on behalf of them and God bless you. Thank you so much, Ali. It was a pleasure being here. And I pray that something that was said today would be a means of blessing and inspiration to someone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today and it was such a pleasure to chat with Reverend Mother. That's what I call her, but Reverend Wilma Gill. And we look forward to seeing you next time as we celebrate Women's Week. Bye.